Good morning. Okay. All right. Um, today has, or yeah, today I am sort of synthesizing a bunch of thoughts that have come from all of my studying this week. Um, so just now when our conversation started, I was talking about something that, um, I don't know, some ideas that, that arose from reading a, I guess, technically commentary on a Tibetan esoteric text. And I've been reading In Search of the Miraculous and listening to B.L. Bub's Tales to His Grandson, um, both Gurdjieff teachings. And I noticed that, at least to me, it seemed like there was some relationship between the way the authors were describing like certain teachings about um, how the subtle and the coarse realms, for lack of a better word, relate to each other. In other words, that like everything that is happening and created in the universe seems to follow this process of like going from some subtle thing into something coarse. You could think of it as like an idea becomes manifest as a form. Um, anyway, I, I started noticing certain parallels between these two different teachings that, you know, came about in very different parts of the world and different times within extremely different cultural contexts and noted that both of them are probably what would be considered advanced slash esoteric, something like that. And I started to wonder, like, what's the point of exoteric teachings? And the, well, yeah, because it seems like there's nothing in there that would actually be helpful. And so I wondered, you know, if there, if there is a purpose for exoteric teachings. I wondered if it was something akin to the way that Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson is set up. Like basically, Gurdjieff crafts this story where, um, like, I think that the whole bulk of the book is basically stories he's telling his grandson because they're on this spaceship that uh, is trying to avoid a comet. So they've like, they've like sort of like parked and they're waiting they're just waiting so they've got all this time and they're talking about all these stories <clears throat> and i wondered if teachings that are considered exoteric are something like that that there's a certain stage in our development possibly where we can't actually do anything about it like we just sort of have to wait and like listen to stories kind of thing and then eventually when time is right we can be introduced properly to the more the actually more helpful teachings which might be considered esoteric so this is all just me trying to wrap my mind around the main types of teachings and what their purpose are because for me it's personally relevant because i've been trying to give my best to writing the message every week for Sunday service. And so this is like a hot topic in my mind. You know, what is helpful to talk about with people? I don't want to waste their time. Mm -hmm. Well, should we go the long way? The scenic let's, route? Let's go the, the best way. Scenic route. It's actually pretty simple. What t 
types of questions are associated with the esoteric technique from your point of view but technique in order to do what why is the question there well what is what yeah. is someone looking for yeah there are a lot of ways that people frame it but um maybe one way one word that describes the aim of probably both of the teachings that i mentioned would be liberation and specifically liberation from our current state of experiencing things that right now we are not really in control of how we're creating our experience we're subject to so many influences and most of the time we don't even realize um and so it seems like the goal is that we want to be able to actually create our lives sure or maybe place or stated more simply to be at peace which is a result of understanding what the hell's happening. Mm -hmm. Or as I always say, if someone put down in front of me a math question, two plus two equals question mark, I wouldn't be threatened at all by that scenario or event. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I'd be totally peaceful because of my understanding of something. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Yeah. I'm saying the difference between esoteric and exoteric is what the student wants. Mm -hmm. Or as we've said a bunch of times, maybe in writing or whatever. Wanting something, having a question, means something is lacking. Mm -hmm. When I'm hungry, it means I'm lacking food. When I want some, when I want something, or I long for something, or I'm yearning for something, I'm inhabiting a state that thinks that that thing that I want isn't there. Now, in some cases, it isn't, like food, mm -hmm. or enough money to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, maybe my sense of isolation, a feeling of loneliness is something that isn't actually there, that I'm generating, or whatever, right? Sure. So there's a, s a scale of longing for things. Some of them are obvious. Some of them are not as obvious. Mm -hmm. Why they're there, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What does someone who is, from a traditional point of view, an esoteric practitioner looking for or wanting versus just if you were to, if you were to try to zoom way out and generalize, what would characterize an exoteric versus an esoteric practitioner? What would you say the differences are in yeah. terms of what yeah. they want? The first want. thing that comes to mind is that is like actually they both want the same thing, but the degree to which they want it and are willing to pursue it differs. Um, like one way I think that we have said it kind of in our group conversations is that what we're what we're really in pursuit of is complete clarity and competence. And it seems like that's what anybody would be in pursuit of, you know, in their own words. But it seems like the esoteric way or teachings provide something, some kind of insight or method 
that can actually get you there? Yeah, I think this is, um, I think I, I hear what you're saying. And I think this is a, a symptom of, I think the way that you're approaching what I'm trying to, what I'm asking is like you've you've been involved for such a long time and with so much intensity in a certain like you know you like you're around real real meaning heavy duty mm-hmm. teachers and students so you're already you already have developed the habit of identifying the aim and seeing the aim all the time something like that Hmm. but which which is great but you know how you know we would always say like we always say like well why doesn't the monastery make a farm Hmm. like why aren't they going down from the mountain Mm-hmm. into town offering programs <clears throat> like interacting with schools and all of that right because if we get too caught up if 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 we're and and it just i th- i think it happens this way where your your exposure exposure to Like you're deeply immersed in the esoteric to the point where you forget about the exoteric. And, and. Uh, Yeah, no, well. Hold on, let me just finish. And we start to, we, we, we don't exercise the common sense muscle um, as much. We're exercising this other critical thinking muscle, let's say. I'm exercising this deep vision, I'm going to call it. I'm exercising my deep vision muscle a lot, but then I'm not exercising also the common sense muscle. I don't want to... I'm I'm trying to set these two phrases up on purpose to, to draw a line in the sand between common sense. Well, common sense is deep vision, no. I'm saying deep vision and common sense, those are different things. Okay? Like, common sense is like, is your shoe tied? Mm -hmm. You know? If if, if, If all I talked to you about was, is your shoe tied? 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 You know, you probably wouldn't think like, this guy's an Einstein, like he has great vision, he's a philosopher or something. You know? Mm-hmm. It's like I, I'm really trying to set it, like really trying to show like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so from one point of view, you could say let's just talk about shoes. Like, you know, like, well, it doesn't make any sense to talk about whether or not your shoe is tied if you don't have shoes. Mm-hmm. And it also doesn't make a lot of sense to try to go out into the world and do anything at all if you don't have shoes. So there are certain basic things, basic, basic, obvious, common sense things that represent the exoteric path in general, I'm saying. If we lose sight of some of those things, such as the need to wear shoes, the need to tie your shoes, Mm -hmm. then even if we have some deep vision, even if we're super well, even if we're bodhisattvas, like high level bodhisattvas or whatever, you know, in some way, and we don't have shoes, it's ineffective. Yes. Now, so, so anyway, okay, I'm saying it's super obvious. 
So I'm trying. So with that said, I want to throw the question back at you and think about what concerns the difference. The difference between esoteric and exoteric is the primary concern of the student or the practitioner of that path. Mm-hmm. You're asking me what the primary concern is for exoteric versus esoteric yeah. practitioners? Yeah. I, the only reason I find it difficult to answer is because <clears throat> it seems like on first thought especially based on how you're dividing up your examples of the two types of teachings, that exoteric practitioners would only be concerned with things regarding, you know, their experience in this life or with the relative stuff. But based on this Tibetan source that I'm reading, they also describe, um, like, what you know, what they would call the universal vehicle, but that it's still an exoteric path within that. So universal vehicle means um, that the practitioner is developing a concern for others to a very high degree, Um, but that I guess they're still missing some part of the big picture. I don't know. I don't know if I really want to go into that right now. But anyway, I'm thinking it's too simplistic to say that ex- exoteric teachings are only concerned with the relative because the example of like the universal vehicle, it still has its transcendent aim. It's not only concerned with the relative, but there's something differentiating it from the esoteric. Let's try to set it up like this. Esoteric basically means secret. Inner. Which basically means invisible. Mm-hmm. It basically means that. Mm-hmm. So, secret meaning invisible, meaning... It's not a thing that meaning 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 if you're going to do it you can only do it doing all these other things also What other things Breathing air, living life, putting your shoes on mm. or whatever Right Mhm so the esoteric is it it unfolds out of the basic things. Mm. Okay. So what I'm saying, so let me just go because this isn't working. So we have a poem called The Evolution which describes the movement which describes the esoteric Uh, excuse me, exoteric, and then towards, right? So, I think we've talked about this in another podcast at some point. When you're hungry, you want food. When you do that enough, when you pursue the satiation of hunger enough when you've done it enough you realize that that doesn't give you any that doesn't give you any it's not like maybe it's delicious maybe like you find a way to like become an amazing farmer or something and that that gives you some meaning or something but in the actual eating in the actual satiation of your hunger you're not also having the revelation of why, why you're here mm-hmm. <clears throat> right Eating food is not 
when you eat food, you're not like feeling like, yeah, this is the answer to my existence, I'm saying. So when I asked you the question initially, I was saying, what is the question that's being asked in these two different things? Mm. Right? Oh, like something like, why am I here? Right. Or... Mm-hmm. Are you here to just eat food? Like we, we've all done that enough to know that, well, yes, we need it. And yes, maybe we can, you know, transform the agriculture industry or something, which mm-hmm. would be amazing. But also it was like, does that really, does that give you maximum revelation about what it means to be a human being? Now, within the exoteric, yes, if someone were to really push toward an understanding of one's connection to other people, that's great. Mm -hmm. But that's still an exoteric teaching. Yes. Right? Because you can see it also. Mm -hmm. You can see that you're driving on a road that you didn't make. Mm Mm-hmm. You can see that you're going into a store to purchase food that you didn't grow and harvest and all of that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying it's not a, that's not a secret. The connection hmm. isn't a secret. We're just not educated to, to, to move around trying to integrate a deeper realization of connection to what we see. Mm-hmm. Okay, but that's not esoteric, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That is not what is being discussed in esoteric teachings. Mm-hmm. That is the basic thing for anybody who's ready to, to, to think about, hey, you're, you're pursuing the satiation of your hunger. How is it that you're doing that? Other people are growing the food, the sun is sun, right? Okay, now there are little bitty intimations of the secret that is revealed in the exoteric because nothing is exists in isolation. So the secret is everywhere. Fine. But anyway, so, you know, when we pursue satiating food, when we, when we pursue satiating our you know, sex impulse. Like maybe that will produce a child and maybe you'll think that that's meaningful and this is giving me more meaning or something. But the the act in itself, if it's just done as the act in itself. And Mechanically? Yeah, not, not, not even just, just doing, even if it's not mechanical, even if it's deliberate. Like try and experiment and see if just engaging in that gives you the answer mm. to who am I? Where am I from? What's the point of all of this? Is there a God? Is, you understand? Mm-hmm. Okay. Try it and see. Try and see if becoming an entrepreneur, having your own business, becoming a CEO, becoming a billionaire, try and see if that's going to give you the answer of why are you here? Where are you from? Is there a God? And all of that. Mm-hmm. Right? Try and see if satiating your longing for, you know, um, a, a, an authentic companionship, a best friend, a life partner, something. Try and see if that, if doing that gives you the answer. Is there a God? Why am I here? Who am I? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that, that there's not uh, something profound in intimacy or sex or food or being successful or being a great mom or dad or child or something, Mm -hmm. there is something meaningful because of the connection in all of those things. You could be the greatest manager anyone's ever had or the greatest boss or you could make the best business that impacts the community or, you know, and so it's something meaningful because of the connection and that's fine. But... Is there some type of mystical revelation inside of those actions that will just spontaneously er emerge from nowhere? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So the esoteric 
the es- what the esoteric is about the revelation of the mystery mm-hmm. and the specific procedures that are the prerequisites for that. Okay? Now, eating food, having sex, being successful, ha- having being the best friend or partner, being a master artist, like those in order in order to be in, in order to really 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 have a positive relationship with satiating your hunger or your sexual impulses or your desire to be successful, or your desire to be a a great friend, or mom, or dad, or colleague, or your desire to be an excellent artist, or whatever, within those things, there's some process that's required. There's some way of being, a way of living, that's required in order to master those things, right? And everybody can see that. Right? There's some way of being, there's some, there's some way to be that everybody can see that will produce a great artist or great this or that or this or that. Or what. It will basically be time spent doing a thing, studying a thing, thinking about a thing. Mm-hmm. Right? And it produces mastery in any of those things. Mm-hmm. The esoteric is the same way. Mm-hmm. But the idea is that nobody can see that. You don't know if you're interacting with an esoteric practitioner or not. Because you'll never see that person actually doing their thing. Mm. Or studying or whatever. You don't know if there's a cert- another process going on in that person's mind, in that person's body or something. Yeah. Yeah. How you can't by definition by definition you can't. That's why it's also you know it's a thing, you know even like big teachers like Zongsar will say the same thing. Like actually, if you're really around that type of like, if you happen to meet that type of teacher. There's not, it's not going to be like they're in an auditorium teaching a thousand people or something. It's just not, that's not the thing. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it's more special or whatever, but just, that's just the math of it. Yeah. So let's take, so I I don't know, is this becoming more clear what I'm starting to say? But let's take like Jordan Peterson, for example. Yeah. You know, grow up, you know. (laughs) Yeah. Grow up and take on some responsibility. Right. You know, that's okay. exoteric. Yes. Yeah. That produces more meaning for sure. Mm-hmm. Because you're lit- because it's because you could say it's triggering the connection reality. This it's triggering your or in other words, you're diving into the highest exoteric teaching mm-hmm. called interbeing, interconnectivity. Okay. That starts mutual responsibility. This is the highest exoteric teaching. Mm-hmm. Mutual responsibility. Connection. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even that, yes, that, well, that will produce meaning, but there's nothing secret about that. Mm-hmm. So now if you were to really... If you, if you were really like, what the, f- really, what the, what's the biggest difference between the two is life and death. This is the real biggest difference. The ex, the exoteric is interested in confronting life. Mm. The exoteric is designed so that we can engage life. Ma- with maximum efficiency. We can engage life with maximum efficiency. That's the exoteric path. The esoteric is engaging death with maximum efficiency. Right? Now, the what I'm saying it's secret or it's hidden or you can't know because if you've ever been around someone who's died, right? If you've ever been around someone who's died, you, you know, after they die, quote unquote, 
their body is there, but you're like, they're not in there anymore. Mm. Right? You're th- they're not in there anymore. Like, I definitely know there was a presence in that body that is not there anymore. Mm. Where did they go? I don't know. Invisible, mm. in other words. Mm-hmm. Invisible, secret. I don't know where they went. And that is the point of secret. You don't know. So, anyway. This is the biggest... That's, that's if you were to really like draw a line in the sand once and for all, what's the difference? Life and death. Mm-hmm. Or death, quote unquote. I think this has helped me understand what I'm actually asking a little bit more. I think underneath my question, I'm trying to grapple with a specific idea of Gurdjieff's. Namely, mm-hmm. that he says... Basically, we can't do anything until we become something. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I subscribe to that or even that I understand what he's really trying to say. But I am trying to understand the point of that teaching and... um, I guess, you know, if we were to take it on face value that we can't actually do anything specifically to improve our experience of life until we get to a certain stage of development of our being, then that is the reason why the question came to my mind, like, what is the purpose of exoteric teachings? You know, if if we have to actually cross a certain threshold in order to really make a permanent change in our lives, in our experience of ourselves, then it seems like exoteric teachings wouldn't do that for us. So here's, here's the thing. The, here, here's the exoteric. There's only one exoteric teaching. Um, I, I'll quote from Neem Karoli Baba. Because this is the easiest way to understand exoteric teaching. Love, serve, remember God. Mm-hmm. That's exoteric teaching. Now, if someone were to try to do that every day, say, okay, today, love, serve, remember God, that person's life would improve. And Good. everything. Forget Gurji, forget whatever, forget all these things. If someone were to say, okay, from today, from this day forward, I'm going to set up a ritual where I really, 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 really try to love, serve, and remember God, then that person's life would improve, right? The life part of it would improve. Don't you think What's that, unclear about that? Don't you think that people who have been engaged in so-called religious wars... I'm not saying religion. I'm not saying that. Just because I'm using the word God doesn't mean... I'm saying love. If you were to love, how could you raise up an arm, a, a weapon, a- or drop a bomb? Agreed. But what if those people who were engaged in so-called religious wars thought that they were loving, thought yeah, that then, they were well, serving I'm saying, I'm saying so and then, thought that they were remembering sure, God? Sure, sure. So then if someone were, were serious about trying to love and serve and remember God, then that, then that person would have to engage in an investigation. What is love? What is service? Yeah. What is God? I'm not, I'm not saying just follow that blindly according to your own, like, what you think the definition of the thing is. I'm mm-hmm. saying if you, if you wanted to just sum up the exoteric path, meaning the study, the contemplation, the meditation, it would be encapsulated in those three statements. Sure. Yeah. And if I'm, someone were yeah. to investigate love, what does that mean? How might one act if one were trying to express love and express mm-hmm. service? And what is the, when, when, when I, when someone uses the word God, what do you mean to say? Like what, you know, Mm-hmm. And do you think that one 
that a practitioner could really understand what those things mean by engaging with exoteric teachings only? Well, again, let's use, let's just keep, keep coming back to this. <clears throat> What's required for anybody to do anything is a teacher. Mm-hmm. I didn't learn to speak English without someone teaching me. I didn't learn how to, you know, become really good at a sport without someone teaching me. I didn't learn how to mix music without someone teaching me, you know, whatever, fine, everything, drive a car, everything. Mm -hmm. So if someone were really serious about the path, that person would begin where you can, where the only place you can begin at the beginning Mm -hmm. in the exoteric space called make the most of yourself. That's the, in other words, if you want to understand the exoteric path, what it, what it is, is make the most of yourself. Hmm. Make the most of yourself. Refine your strengths and transform all your weaknesses also into strengths so that you can offer that to other people. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the exoteric path. If, if anyone were to try to do that, they would need help doing that. Mm-hmm. Right? Or... In other words, if someone were, try, were really going to try to love and serve and remember God, someone would need help from a spiritual friend, quote unquote, mm-hmm. as the definition of an exoteric teacher, a, a mentor who seems to be peaceful competent, excellent at something, Mm -hmm. you know, who seems to be embodying the the capacity to love and offer one's best to the world Mm -hmm. and, you know, maintain some transcendent aim or some moral compass or something like that, okay? Then that would be the maximum... Anyway, does does that make... Am I it clear? Mm-hmm. To engage life to the max, to offer one's life to the planet, to the max. Mm-hmm. That is the esoteric path. Yeah. The esoteric path is to offer one's death. Okay. So, yeah. Go, go ahead. Are you? Are you? No. Yeah. Long no. Long? Because I'm saying. Because I'm saying. It's. It. It is. It is at that gateway where we can have, where the opportunity is. Yeah. For the mystery to be unveiled in whatever degree we're prepared Mm -hmm. to receive. Mm -hmm. This, I think, starts to answer another question that started bubbling when I was reading, you know, Gurdji stuff. Which is kind of, you know, me wondering to what extent should we um, take literally or seriously the idea about not being able to do anything. And I, based on this conversation, it seems now that that statement is definitely esoteric, meaning that its purpose, or it's one, it's not to be taken literally. And that the purpose of thinking about that and considering that in a way we can't do anything is to take us beyond the exoteric teachings so that basically we can die. Yeah, but I also think you're you're reading into it a little bit too much as well, saying the symptom of being immersed in the esoteric culture so, so much that now you actually have the Vajra view and you're looking at everything from a, like a synthesized point of view already so like you can't not like you can't help but interpret everything that you see in a vajra manner whatever where it's coming which is that's the way it's supposed to be but i'm saying Mm. but i'm saying also it's also now a a challenge would be to take yourself out of that space and just try to read the thing read the thing and interpret it even more broadly like 
we can't do anything. We, we of ourselves do nothing. Something like that, right? Yeah. Right. Um, is it the hunger in you that's doing, that's doing the shopping? Maybe. Maybe. Right? Is it the, is it the, the impulse mm-hmm. to get jiggy that's taking you to the club? Mm-hmm. Probably, right? So that's, that's what he means. He's pointing to the satiation cycles. Like, I don't get, I, how can I, is it, is it really I'm getting hungry or is my body mm-hmm. saying something? Mm-hmm. Am I getting horny or is my biological process doing something? Mm. Do I really need to go become the king of the world or is that some psychological, mm-hmm. deeper cultural thing going on? Yeah. Do I really need to go and hug a friend right now or is that like some psychological distortion like some thing blinding me from the fact that actually all the atoms in my body are hugging all the other atoms in the universe all the time. And like, it's the nature of some atomic particles to constantly be in contact with everything. And like, I'm forgetting that, or I'm not experiencing that. Mm-hmm. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why I was saying that, you know, if, if someone were to look at the way that we've outlined the chakras, quote unquote, and like actually understand their meaning, we would think of them as, as, you know, or from another point of view, like we, we are in the best position possible. We're like, so we're completely endowed with the greatest situation possible. We have master, we have gods. Like, it's like your stomach. Your stomach has like, your stomach isn't doing shit. It's the bacteria in your stomach mm. that's doing shit, mm-hmm. you know? And, and we can choose to like cultivate a really amazing bacteria or when the bacteria gets unhappy, then there, it's not good. Mm-hmm. We don't like that, you know? So like, we're, we're like this invisible thing that has this thing called a stomach and then inside of the stomach, there's like all these different other things that are actually doing the shit. Mm. So the same thing is true of us as beings, quote unquote. We're like this invisible thing that has a form. Mm-hmm. And inside of the form, there are these gods basically doing the shit. Mm. Now, that's, that's the head side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that we're this invisible thing that has this f- form and there are these demons inside of us running the show. Or that's a one way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Or another way to look at it is we are an invisible thing that has a form and inside of it are machines doing shit. Okay? And then we think, I think I'm the machine. Mm. I think I'm my desire to satiate my hunger. Mm. And so when, when the body gets hungry, I forget that it's the body that's hungry. And I say, I'm hungry. Yeah. The I isn't hungry. How can something invisible be hungry? That makes no sense. Okay. Right. So, so I think I'm the machine and I just go around driven by the mechanism of hunger. Mm -hmm. This is what Gurdjieff is saying. Yes. Okay. I think I'm the machine. So I just go around driven by the mechanism of ooh, ah, he, ooh, eh, he, ah, ooh, ooh, eh, 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 eh. Yeah? You dig what I'm saying? How can something that's invisible want to go ooh, ah, he, uh, uh, or feel like it needs to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Or even feel the feeling of it. It makes no sense. So, so th- that's what he mean, means to say. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think... It'll, anyway. No, yeah, I think uh, also it's a great example. I, I like going with the machine example because machines need operators. Like, they don't... Yeah. You know? And so if, we, if we've forgotten that 
we are actually the operators. And instead, the operator is overly identified as the machine, then like it will operate the machines, but it'll be so confused and yeah, they'll just good. run haywire and then they become like demons. Yeah. We only th- you, we th- we think it's like, you know, when we say when we say demon, we we're like implying that there's some terrible outcome. You know, or some like outcome that we know like innately for some reason, you know, isn't good. Mm-hmm. Like destroying shit or your life is fucked up or something. There's a demon possessing me. Then my life is fucked up. You know, yeah. it's like we equate the things like that. Yes. But if we were if we were you know, good property managers, then the same force would ha- the, the same exact function would produce a heavenly state of being. Mm-hmm. Beautiful surroundings, positive relationships, yeah. an understanding of the processes. So we're utilizing them, you know, anyway. Mm-hmm. That's obvious. Yeah. This is what Gurdjieff is saying. Yeah. It's what anybody's, anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So actually, this is interesting. In a way, it's like uh, the exoteric teachings will take you part of the way there mm-hmm. in learning how to govern these machines or these properties within you. And then after a certain point, then esoteric teachings are needed to understand, you know, various other types of machines that you are yeah. supposed to be governing. The, the, the centers or the chakras or whatever is the bridge between both the exoteric and the esoteric. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Is this enough or not? Answers my question. Okay. Thank you. We're out of here. Out of here, folks.